Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, calling to order the meeting of the Environment Committee for Tuesday, August 28, 2018. Uh, first item to deal with is the approval of the agenda. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Next on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Were there any changes or corrections to our minutes from last week? Last I wasn't time. here, so <laughs> move approval. We have a motion. So moved. And the second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes have been approved. Now we move into the business section of the meeting, and the first item on our agenda is a, a joint um, sure. same week item 2018-216 JTSWs. Sole source procurement for eBuilder and Adam Gordon is going to explain this to us. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Council Members. My name is Adam Gordon. I'm manager of engineering services under the technical services department. Uh, presenting here uh, business item number 2018-216. It's a joint business item between uh, transportation and environment. Uh, we're providing this uh, business item tonight and then transportation will provide on September 10th. And then the joint meeting will be presented at, will be September 12th. The uh, Business item is full for a sole source procurement of eBuilder. Uh, eBuilder is a construction management software uh, that has been used since 2015 uh, by the uh, Metro Transit. Uh, they proposed from nine different vendors, uh, selected eBuilder amongst those. Uh, since then, it's been used by each of the project offices, uh, Central Corridor. Uh, the Green Line Extension, Blue Line Extension, uh, engineering facilities. And just to note that uh, eBuilder is also used by quite a few of our state partners, Minskew, uh, it's used by the City of Minneapolis Public Schools, City of St. Paul, the Mayo Clinic Modernization Program. Um, and Environmental Services is just getting around to uh, entering uh, uh, these are asking for uh, the opportunity to use these tools. Uh, what we expect with this tool is that for construction, uh, we'll have a lot of reduced labor time associated with repetitive data entry, uh, expedited re our approvals, real-time project status reports, and reduced time around our time turnaround with requests for information and change orders. So it's a uh, a construction management tool that's built in the cloud. Uh, we see a lot of cost savings. Uh, Metro Transit recently provided us a list of different applications they've already set up, and we're well into having more than 20 applications set up to help economize uh, their efforts in the field. Um, the Thrive Lens Analysis. Uh, we're expecting this uh, as uh, positive outcomes for prosperity and stewardship, increasing efficiency, lowers our administration costs to deliver projects, uh, and providing facilities that are well designed and constructed uh, will help us maintain our transit systems and water wastewater facilities. The proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council authorizes the regional administrator to award execute a sole source procurement contract with eBuilder Inc. in the amount not to exceed one million eight hundred twenty thousand over a five year period from September twenty eighteen to November twenty twenty three with costs divided between environmental services approximately one million one hundred eighty three thousand and Metro Transit six hundred thirty seven thousand and at this point, I can take some questions. Very good. Are there questions from committee? Councilmember Wolf. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. How did they decide the cr the cost breakdown for the different entities? The cost are, well, the initial cost uh, for ES would include um, approximately 200000 to actually set up the software and, and to train our people on how to use it. And then there's a subscription fee, and the subscription fee is actually uh, gauged on our spend within the capital program. Our spend is about $140 million a year, um, whereas uh, Metro Transit has been about $90 million a year. So our subscription rate is actually higher than theirs. And so that's the reason the cost difference between the two. Okay. Has anyone uh, projected or given some, you know, when the return on the investment, at what point does your savings cover this? cost right um, industry says that you can achieve uh, close to five percent efficiency increases uh, both across the board from contractor to consultants to your administration staff I think that's rather uh, liberal my guess is it's probably between one to two percent and of course the software is at one percent so we're we're still looking at a fairly quick payback to, you know we're going to start seeing things within a two two year to three year time frame before the contract is up. Mm -hmm. Other questions? If not, um, is there a motion to uh, approve the proposed action? Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Mm -hmm. Opposed? The motion prevails. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. Thank you. Is this the first time we've seen you here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought so. Uh, the next item on the agenda is also a, a joint committee um, item 2018-220, joint JT, and it's the City of Landfall Village 2040 Comprehensive Plan, and Kyle Colvin is going to present. Yes. And Kyle is familiar. Good afternoon, <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this item is seeking action on the City of Landfall's uh, 2040 Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Uh, the This will be a joint item uh, as is common with all of the sanitary sewer uh, comp plan update plans with community development committee uh, there is one typo on this slide uh, it is not a same week item mm -hmm. so going into that uh, as i stated today uh, the committee will be acting on the city's comprehensive sewer plan or wastewater plan uh, the community development committee acted on the city's update at their meeting last week monday and this item is scheduled to go before the full council at their September 12th meeting, whereby the council will act to approve the city's wastewater plan and advise the city to implement their 2040 comp plan update. A little bit of background. Uh, Landfall is located in West Central Washington County and is located in Metropolitan District Number 11. It's uh, uh, located north along uh, Interstate 94, surrounded by the city of Oakdale, and uh, north of Woodbury and east of Maplewood. It consists primarily, the entire community consists primarily of manufactured uh, homes. There's a couple of single family uh, residential units that are uh, located within the park, but it's primarily um, manufactured homes with some commercial development located along uh, I-94. Uh, the park is uh, essentially built out with virtually all of the lots uh, currently being occupied by either residential or commercial development. Uh, the city's forecasts between the census number uh, uh, that, that was taken in 2010 and 2040 reflects some modest growth of about 43 sewered homes and five additional employees. However, uh, in communications with the city and their response to the system statements, the city indicated that uh, since the 2010 census, all, all of the vacant lots uh, have pre pretty much been um, built on. So their forecasts essentially uh, represents no growth between 2020 and 2040. Um, 
Okay, the city does not have any uh, subsurface treatment systems. They're entirely served uh, with local and regional sewer service. Uh, and the city has not been identified as a community with excess I and I. Uh, they've never been assigned an I and I work plan by the council, and I get into that uh, a little bit later. Thrive designates landfall as a suburban community, which uh, if, uh, if the city were to have growth, that would require that uh, the growth would be uh, residential densities uh, no less than uh, five units per acre. However, as I indicated earlier, they pretty much built out. Uh, wastewater flow generated within landfall is not measured due to the uh, small nature of the community and the, uh, the little uh, volume of wastewater it generates. Uh, most of the flow um, that, uh, well, as I indicated earlier, Oakdale surrounds landfall and so the majority of Oakdale actually flows through uh, the city of landfall. So by virtue of landfall generating so little flow, it's, it's hard to actually, through metering, de detect what the amount of flow that uh, landfall is measuring. So because of that lack of metering, uh, there is no ability to actually measure peak flow generated within the community. And therefore, that's why the city has never been assigned an I-9 mitigation plan. Uh, in the 1990s, the city uh, uh, replaced its entire collection system, both the laterals located in the street and the uh, services that uh, provide service to each of the individual units within the park. So because of that uh, uh, relatively new nature of the system and it was built with um, uh, new materials, gasketed joints, uh, there's little expectation that the city of Landfall would actually have any excess I&I &I, uh, within, within the community. However, having said that, the city does have uh, an ordinance that prohibits the connection of sump pumps, foundation drains, and rain layers from the sanitary sewer system. And uh, they also uh, include in their plan a stormwater management plan that addresses II sources through area flooding and illicit area drain connection, sanitary uh, sewer inspection, and public education efforts regarding I and I. Thrive analysis: uh, the plan supports the outcomes of the Thrive uh, Thrive Lens. Uh, it supports stewardship, prosperity, and sustainability uh, through uh, the program of uh, local and regional infrastructure. We can time regional investments uh, at the level and time that they're needed, uh, thereby uh, being efficient, cost efficient, providing those services, which. Uh, from a prosperity standpoint, uh, translates into lower wastewater rates. We don't have to build uh, infrastructure sooner than needed. That saves uh, the region money. And also uh, supports sustainability through the uh, continued uh, uh, element in addressing uh, excess I, I from entering into the system. So in conclusion, uh, the findings of the comprehensive plan review uh, indicates that the city's plan conforms to the regional wastewater system plan. Uh, it's also consistent with other council adopted plans and policies. Uh, it satisfies all of the requirements of the uh, sanitary sewer uh, plan elements and the regional wastewater system has sufficient capacity to serve uh, the level of um, the wastewater flow and growth that's stated in the plan. So with that, uh, today's uh, proposed action uh, is to approve the City of Landfall's Comprehensive Sewer Plan component of the 24 Comprehensive Plan and to advise the City to implement the Environment Committee's advisory comments that are contained on page 2 of the business item. And with that, I can answer any questions. Thank you. We, uh, you show uh, about 300 households <coughs> in 2040. It that, sounds like they have that now. That, that is correct, Madam. <laughs> what, what, what is the approximate population of this community? Well, I would I would anticipate somewhere. Be, actually, it should be in the should be in the table in the business item. Uh, <coughs> population, according to the 2010 census, the population was 663. 663. Residents. Interesting. 
and that's projected to increase to 740 by uh, 2040. Excellent. Are there any questions from the committee? Well, so we'll, if you make a motion, I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Right. Aye. aye. Opposed? The motion carries. It's really Thank you. And congratulations. One, one more down. <laughs> Ready to go. <laughs> so the last item on our business agenda is 2018-230, the Empire Polymer Contract. And Joe Ward is going to visit with us. Now, Joe, is this your first time? Two. Mm -hmm. Two. Your second time. Yes. All right. Real I, veteran. I don't know about that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, my name is Joe Ward. I'm a process engineer in the support services business unit. And I'm here today to talk about a polymer contract for the Empire wastewater plant. Uh, a little background. Our polymer is a conditioning chemical, which helps in the dewatering process when we feed it with the sludge into centrifuges or belt presses, in this case, belt presses. And as part of the process here. We did a formal invitation for bids on December 8th, 2017, and we received two bids and we opened those on February 1st of 2018. Following that, we did a full-scale polymer trial in June, excuse me, and in, through that we found that uh, we, we tested three different polymers and Polydyne was found to be the, uh, the best product there, or the most cost-effective, excuse me. And the unit cost, I, I apologize, I made a typo here. The 21 to 27 dollars is uh, actually 4650 to uh, make sure I get this correct to 5636. Uh, the 21 to 27, there was the dosage of polymer that it takes. <laughs> so, um, and estimated expenditures uh, from this procurement are estimated to be two hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, this action advances the thrive outcome of stewardship. Public financial resources will be invested efficiently and effectively to maintain proper operation of the metropolitan disposal system, which protects the region's natural resources. And the proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council authorize its regional administrator to award and execute a contract to Polydyne Inc. of Riceboro, Georgia to provide Clariflock polymers at a unit price of 89 cents per pound delivered to the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant. This contract will be for a period of two years with an option to extend for three additional one-year periods with a total procurement not to exceed $1 million. Thank you. Are there questions? Move approval? I have a, a question. Um, yeah. Is polymer is the product you use a plastic? What what is it? Yes, it's um, it's mainly composed of oil. It's petroleum based, and uh, the the active component is a is a plastic that sort of binds it. It grabs the solids and separates it from the water. It's a mm -hmm. flocculent, really. Good. So when the solids are now, do you burn the solids and and mm -hmm. where? They're, they're land applied at Empire. They're land applied. So these polymers are applied to the land with the solids? Yes, that's correct. Is there any hazard? <laughs> or... a, a polymer is not a hazardous material. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, are, are you referring to kind of the plastic? Yeah. The idea of a plastic. I, I'm just thinking of all these, you know, the 3M thing and the other things that get in our water. Does does anything happen with these polymers? Um, no, not uh, polymers are. Boy, I guess I haven't looked into that that level of detail. Polymers are, are very widely used, mm -hmm. and um, I'd have to research a little further the details of how how exactly that. Uh, that bonding happens and if there's any sort of plastics left over, but I believe the answer is no, that there are, there's no hazardous material left behind okay. the, uh, the solids. I just get curious every time I come across uh, mm -hmm. a, a new report on, you know, chemicals mixing with our, our, the chemicals we use to purify the water and other things getting into our water. So I'm yeah. always kind of, especially when it sounds like a plastic or, or a petroleum product. Yes. 
Oh, I certainly research that. Yeah, I, I, if if you have if you can find a little mm -hmm. summary about you know why this is not harmful, I would appreciate it. Okay, all right, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Now a motion has been made by uh, Councilwoman Wolf. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Propose. The uh, right. proposed action carries. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, now we move to the information portion of our meeting, and uh, Karen Nace is going to introduce two of our interns, I believe. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, two weeks ago, you'll all remember the posters that were all around, and it generated a lot of interest, and our interns were all here to explain their projects. But we thought, um, well, that was kind of the capstone of their, their summer, but they also gave presentations to our staff, and they did that on two different days. I listened to all of them. They're great presentations, so we thought we'd invite a few of them to this meeting. So we have two today. Um, we had... We're going to have a third attendee, but Melanie was out sick today. Mm. So who we have today is Aaron Wedstein and Katie Kolath. So they'll take turns coming up here. Aaron will start, and hopefully you'll enjoy the presentations and get to experience some of the great work they did all summer. Thank you. Welcome, Aaron. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and Committee members. My name is Aaron Wedstein. And I was the river and stream monitoring intern here this summer, but they used the knowledge that I had kind of more my background from college. So I actually did a project with the Empire Wetland and conducting a survey on that to um, kind of see the overall health of the wetland um, and how it's changed over time since it um, was restored in 2003. And just kind of uh, overall what can be done for management and future projects. Uh, so just a little bit of background, and I'm sure you guys um, know a little bit about this wetland. Uh, it was restored in 2003 by the Metropolitan Council and the Friends of the Mississippi River. It was a joint project on a 50-acre parcel of land just north of the Empire Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, and this, uh, it was restored from previously from farmland. Um, only seven acres of it was a wetland, so uh, 43 acres um, was restored to a fresh meadow wetland. Uh, and this has been a really great asset to the council because of the wetland credits um, that we've obtained from creating this. And the current value is $1 million approximately on the wetland credit trading market. So that's um, obviously proactive maintenance and monitoring is really important, um, not only just to maintain the value of the land uh, for habitat and water quality and all the other benefits wetlands do, but also for the um, financial benefit that the council obtains from that. So what we did was we conducted our survey using following the guide that was written by the MPCA, which is called the Rapid Floristic Quality Assessment Meth Manual. Um, and that method is developed to be done to do a survey of the wetland quickly. Um, you know, it shouldn't take more than a couple hours and it can be done by someone who's not exactly a trained botanist. Um, I do have quite a bit of plant experience, but I'm by no means an expert. So um, this was a really great way um, to be able to survey the wetland um, in a timely fashion. And I did that with two other um, council employees, uh, Jen, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, <laughs> Jen Kay and then Eric Herberg. Um, so they helped me out there quite a bit. Um, so what we found was we did, the survey was just where you meander and you walk around. Um, and it took us 50 minutes. Uh, the minimum amount of time was 30 minutes to conduct the survey. And then if you continue to find new species, you um, would continue to walk and survey. So we had to continue for two more 10 minute time periods because we kept finding new species, which is good. Um, even though it was hot and there was a lot of mosquitoes out there, we were excited to continue <laughs> to walk around. Um, so what we found uh, were the five main species that covered the most, uh, the largest percent of the wetland were swamp milkweed, prairie ironweed, big blue stem, river bulrush, and reed canary grass. And only reed canary grass is an invasive species of those five. Um, so that was really good to see that the wetland was covered mainly by native species. Um, just because obviously that means that the wetland is of greater value. Um, it's just better, it's a better quality wetland. 
Um, so what we looked at for results, um, what we took from what we got in the field, we looked at when we were out there, we recorded all the species we found and the percent approximately that they covered. I um, mean, going back, I calculated different results and these are just two of the main parameters that we looked at was species richness and then the proportion of invasive cover. So we compared data from, um, from 2018 to 2006 when the last formal survey was conducted uh, with um, data on species abundance. So it's been quite a while since this has been done. Um, ideally, it'd be nice to have data points closer together, um, which is something that hopefully in the future then we can um, do that from now on every couple years. Um, so we found that 2006 actually had greater native species richness, and they had about the same amount of invasive um, species that were found each year, but the proportion of invasive cover decreased um, pretty substantially um, from 35% in 2006 to only 18% of the wetland being covered by um, invasive species in 2018, um, which was really good to see that, that um, native species cover a larger percent, just because over time, generally invasive species can kind of become rooted and they're just hard to get rid of. So it was good to see that the maintenance we've been doing has been effective, um, which goes to some of the main conclusions we found. So the graph over there is just a very kind of simplified, easy to look at graph, um, taking one of the, um, it's a WC score, which I won't get into what that is, but it just gives an overall assessment of the what category it falls into. So our wetland is still in the fair category, um, but as you can tell, it's kind of hard. There's, the good is very small, what is considered good by the MPCA standards. So even though the wetland is still fair, it's, it's a lot better fair, I guess. Um, so it's increased. Um, and the value of the land and native plant diversity, as I said, has increased, which increases the financial value of the land as well, um, which is good. So if we were to sell the land, um, it would go for a higher price, um, which also then goes to the second bullet point, just proving that the management efforts in the past have been effective and that they should continue to be done. Um, so on the picture on the lower right, that's of the prairie burn that was done last year. Um, we've done four burns since the wetland was established in 2003. And that's definitely the most effective way to get rid of invasive species. So um, our results kind of show that that should continue every couple of years to do a burn. Um, and we also just do herbicide spraying to get rid of invasive species and reseeding of plants. Um, and the maintenance costs have gone down substantially each year. Uh, I think it's only about $1,000 a year now to maintain it. Um, and the initial costs, I believe, were about 20000 that first year. So it's continued to decrease um, over time. And then the last thing that um, this, the survey and then for future is just that it can be used as a case study and demonstration project. Uh, I know the council uh, helped with a new uh, wetland establishment down at the Hastings plant um, and other organizations have kind of been looking and seeing at what we've done. So this wetland can just be a good example to just show other organizations um, that a restoration project can be done and be effective. So if you have any questions, I'll take those. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you, Erin. Are there questions for Erin? Council member. Um, thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I'm curious because one of your slides mm -hmm. had, um, I think the species was 41 yep. and 33. Now, um, why is there such, I mean, that's nearly a quarter mm -hmm. of the species, um, a decrease of a quarter. So what, what was involved in that? Was that because of us, nat you know, was it natural or us like burning out these species or, or why is there such a big difference? Yeah, variety. so what we kind of thought was maybe part of those reasons where there was, um, when they put from the empire plant, they switched where the, uh, the effluent was going to go out. So they put the, um, the pipe through the wetland. And I believe, I'm not sure what that year, was it 2006 maybe? Okay, I'm not sure, but it was after that time, I believe. So we had to reseed that area. So some of the native plant species might not have um, come back after that. And also, um, after you do a burn, some species just take longer naturally to come back. So they might not um, have, we just, they might've been too small to identify. Um, so if you look in a couple of years, that number might go up. And then as I was explaining to other people during the poster session too, 
a lot of plants like milkweed are just very, um, they just spread very quickly too. So they've kind of taken over a large portion of the wetland. So they might've actually outcompeted other native species too. So those were kind of some of our thoughts. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So do we put in new plants or new seeds after we do a burn or? Uh, no, I uh, just kind of let it come back naturally. Um, just a lot of these species are adapted to periodic burns. So yep, just a natural process. Very interesting. Well, we appreciate the work you did. Thank you. I have really enjoyed my time here and I actually got extended to stay. So I'm excited to continue to help out. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Erin. And after Erin, we have Katie Kolath. Hi, Katie. Hi, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Katie Kolath. And let's see, slides are up. Um, I will give you a little bit of background on who I am and uh, what my interests are. Um, I go to school currently at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. I am in my final semester, woo, almost there, um, major health services management with minors in leadership and biology. Um, I'm also very interested in public health, project management, and finance, which is a lot of the reason that I ended up in the role that I did this summer, which was continuous improvement. So um, this is my team here. Christine in the middle is my mentor slash boss. Um, Cassie was an urban scholar with me this summer. And we worked um, in the continuous improvement department, which is in the, in the environmental services division, um, to really help to build a culture behind these tools, this mindset, and this methodology. Continuous improvement is something that can be applied in our professional life and in our personal life as a way to really uh, unify and define um, what we would like to be doing right now and in the future. And so um, it's taking something that currently exists and trying to make it better, trying to make it more cost effective, trying to make it more time effective, trying to make it more fun for the employees and staff, trying to make it um, better communication amongst our teams. So um, I personally am very invested in this um, because I think that in any organization, we need to be able to really um, unify our efforts and work as a team towards something. Um, and unless we're really willing to invest in the tools and kind of standardizing some of our processes, that's really difficult to do, especially in an organization as large as this. So that said, um, I worked this summer specifically on strategy mapping, which essentially is a vehicle um, that will help us to organize and unify our direction for the next two to five years. So this project has been going on for years. Um, I think three years ago was the very first uh, unit that decided to do a strategy map. And um, this summer we worked with the process computing group which is the group of people that work in the, the metro plant to make sure that all of our um, techn technology basically works in the plant. Um, and it's all process driven. So there was a lot of metrics that we were able to define. So why do we do this? Well, like I said, we're all pulling in different directions unless we're able to define what we'd like to be doing. And so this is kind of a visual of what strategy mapping does. It helps us to sit down and have a conversation about where we would like to be going two to five years from now. And so our goal is to get not only the managers on board, but to get buy-in from the staff as well. And to make sure that we have, um, as a group, really talked about where we would like to be going and to get all the voices heard in that process. Um, that way it's more collaborative and we can really get that buy-in, like I said. So what is the process itself? Well, we start off by getting a team together and collecting as much information as possible about where our current state is. What's working? What isn't? What are the opportunities that might be coming down the road? What are the threats? Um, and then, so that would be a SWOT analysis. That's, that's looking at our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and our threats. Then we define them. We like to look at, well, what's our current mission, vision, and values? Where would we like to be going two to five years from now? And let's get all the voices at the table, right? Let's, let's get the entire team sitting down to talk about this. Um, and then together, we make a plan. We decide what are the objectives that are really important to us? 
How can we define what success looks like? And then what are the baby steps that we can take towards those different objectives? And then the last step would be to do it. So this is something that is easy to say and can be very difficult in real life. And so that's part of where the continuous improvement team comes in is to help facilitate that conversation moving forward. So who's doing this? Like I mentioned, um, all the different departments across environmental services are hoping to do a strategy map. So currently, um, lab services, industrial waste, and I believe the performance excellence and analytics group has done their um, strategy map. And then this summer, I helped out with the process computing group. And then uh, the last three there, the process engineering, R&D, and air quality, the continuous improvement, sustainability. Uh, actually, continuous improvement is done. But sustainability and the process engineering still need to do theirs. So this is what support services uh, strategy map looks like. Um, currently, we do not have a finalized version of the process computing group because, again, it's a collaborative process. It takes time to do. Um, but as you can see here, in these large bubbles um, are the objectives. So um, generally, they're, they're broad. Um, and the goal is to be able to set metrics behind each one of these that would help us to define what success looks like in each of these categories. Um, the team sat down and talked through every one of these points on here. What are the advantages to our department? What are we good at? And how can we maximize on those? And challenges, what are we struggling with? And how can we help to mitigate those issues? Um, goals, what are the A, B, C, and D? What are our next steps? Uh, where would we like to be going? And so the cool thing about this um, is that it's a visual. So these are posters. They're posted in the departments in regular spaces that people can be seen, seeing them regularly. And the goal is to really make sure that we have um, a continued conversation around this, that it doesn't just get set on a shelf somewhere and dropped. Um, so the cool thing about this is that it's a very visual tool. So what was my role in the process? Well, I was helping to coordinate, co-facilitate, and document for this process. Um, it was a great opportunity to do a lot of networking. It was a great opportunity to test my skills. And it was really cool to be able to see my mentor in action as well. Um, to see, it's, it's one thing to talk about these things and, and prepare for them on a computer, like a lot of internships have you do. <laughs> but for this internship, I was really able to participate in the process. And that was just a very valuable experience that I will definitely be taking with me as I go forward. Um, also, the performance, excellence, and analytics, and the industrial waste, um, I surveyed them to see how their process went because continuous improvement. We'd like to improve our own process as well. Just because we're doing it doesn't mean it works. So the results of that, um, as you can see here, this is on a six-point scale. And I asked them the questions that are on the right of the screen. Um, essentially, was your process clear? Do you know where you're going now? Is it, uh, was it a collaborative process? Did we know what we were talking about? Um, just very general questions to kind of gauge the satisfaction around the process itself. So on a six point scale, we landed right around an average of four and a half. Um, and that would be uh, the six is strongly agree and zero is strongly disagree. So we hung out right around agree, which is, which is pretty good for a survey, mm. um, but again, we'd like to improve a little bit. So I would like to note on question five, which was the process for developing our strategy helped to improve my relationships with my colleagues. So I'd like to note this because we hung right around agree on this one. And it's important to note that because our goal behind this is to get people to really build community behind this. And, and we're marching forward together. We're not just you know kind of ostracizing one another's ideas. And so this is something that we would like to work on as we move forward in our processes um, to really improve um, and make sure that people are building relationships in this process. And so how we're hoping to do that is just to um, create more space for the staff members to have the conversation and not just the managers. Um, because even though we have managers and staff in the same room, that hierarchy can still exist. And so we would like to ask the managers to maybe step back and let the staff bring their opinions and ideas forward. Um, and then also mitigate the conversation and manage the conversation to make sure that doesn't turn into finger pointing mm -hmm. as we move forward. So 
with that said, um, I'd also like to look at the actual breakdown of the results. So as you can see here, some of these are pretty um, strongly disagree and strongly agree. They're pretty polarized. Um, and so we'd like to note that this process itself, collaboration is difficult. Not everyone wants to collaborate. Some people would like to just kind of operate as a silo or operate on their own. And so it's important that we note that um, although this is a process that we think is valuable and a process that hopefully ends up being uh, valuable going forward, which I believe it is, um, that there is still a little bit of pushback against it. And, and so digging further into that and trying to understand where that comes from is important as well. But I'd also like to note that we only have a 32% response rate for this entire survey, which is pretty dismal. But um, I think part of that was the fact that it was a survey and it wasn't a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation. It can be really difficult to gauge the actual satisfaction of something through a survey, especially because of survey fatigue and how often we do these here at Metropolitan Council or any organization for that matter. So um, maybe brainstorming different ways to get different satisfaction results. And maybe even that's just a conversation at the end of the meeting and talking um, about, you know, what, what do we like, what do we not like, and how can we improve going forward? So what are the lessons learned from this? Um, overall, the consensus was people were really glad to be in, in a part of this process. Um, a lot of times people aren't involved and that's that can be really difficult for staff, especially when we're trying to push towards collaboration. It's difficult to get people to buy in. So um, it was cool to see that people thought that their voice mattered and that they were a part of the process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we also would like to suggest for managers moving forward that they're not leading the discussion, but allowing for others to be part of it, for their voices to be heard. Uh, the third point there, follow up is important, right? This, this process is only as good as the accountability that we create behind it True. moving forward. So if we are not able to have our leaders and our staff members bought into this and willing to walk towards the objectives that we set, the objectives don't matter. And so um, it's important that as continuous improvement that we continue to follow up with that. And also as teams that we're able to communicate about this in the future, bring it up in our daily work and talk about where we would like to be going and if this is really, uh, if the work that we're doing is helping us to get there. The fourth, fourth point there I mentioned, maybe a non-survey format might be better to be able to get some data behind this. So one of my program takeaways is that uh, leadership matters. Um, I know all of you are here because you really care about what is happening in this committee and in this city. And it's important that we have our voices to the table, but that we also have leaders that are willing to commit to the things that we talk about. Um, every time that we gather here, we talk about things that, you know, proposals that are coming forward and things that we would like to be doing in the Twin Cities. But what really matters is our willingness and ability to really stand behind them and not just say yes, but do yes. So um, that's that's a key takeaway and, and continuous improvement. It's incredibly important. Also, I learned that wastewater matters. It's not yeah. something you think about. It's not something you think about at all until you work at the plant. You're like, wow, this is amazing. It has so many gallons of waste every day and it's a process you don't think about at all. So I definitely appreciate it when I flush the toilet now. <laughs> Another takeaway is that relationships are the currency of leadership and power. Really, it matters who we are in relationship with and why it is that we're in relationship with them. And um, when it comes to these collaborative efforts, it's important that we really are willing to be uh, a team and really willing to work together and are genuinely interested in one another. Um, and then skills developed, those are some uh, continuous improvement terms down there, but generally a lot of the tools that uh, our continuous improvement driven, I got the opportunity to apply this summer. So I did a lot of informational interviews, a lot of networking this summer. Like I said, relationships matter. So it was a great opportunity to experience uh, different sides of the Metropolitan Council and kind of walk across the catwalk and do different things that maybe a normal employee would not be able to do or experiences the general staff doesn't get to see. And then I also had great mentorship and great friends and um, the environmental services department which was amazing so that's 
that's my presentation. Thank you all for the opportunity to present today and for letting me tell you about what I did this summer. I'm very passionate about it and excited about it, and I would love to hear your questions. Thank you, Kathy. Are there questions for Kathy? Councilmember so Melander? Just the uh, uh, ES employees were surveyed? Yes, okay. just the uh, pro pro performance, excellence, and analytics, and the lab services. So Sorry, that's how many people? Um, I think it was like 56. Okay. Yeah. Councilmember McCarthy. So of that 56, what percentage would be a good response rate? Well, if you ask SurveyMonkey, 93. <laughs> but yeah, so we would, I mean, I would consider 50%, um, especially because we're working with a lot of engineers and uh, very data-driven people that may not really um, see value in uh, continuous improvement effort. Does that mean it's not valuable? No. Does that mean that they might not be interested in it? Yes. So um, it's a matter of who you ask. But I would, I think it's valuable. To get metrics. Good. Councilmember McCarthy. Madam Chair, have we ever done this before? What? This kind of mapping, strategy mapping? I think we have, haven't we? So, Support Services has theirs done, but I'm not sure if your specific committee has. I just want to make a comment that, oh, go ahead. I, we've been, since we start, did our strategic plan in 2014, 2015, there was a lot of that involved with that effort, and we've been continuing to refine and update and do more of these continuous improvement collaborative approaches where we involve staff and ask the managers to kind of step back and be part of the group so that we hear all the voices. Just a comment that um, it's wonderful that we that we're doing this because, you know, many of the um, competitive or um, effective businesses do this. And the fact that we have an inter I mean, people pay a lot of money for this. And the fact that we have an intern who can do this, I mean, just tells you the quality of the people that we bring on board. So thank you. Thank you. And I thought you presentation was as enthusiastic as it sounds that your interest is. You really came across very positive. Really, really appreciate the work you did this summer. Thank you. Thank you for letting me. And you finish in December then? I finish in December, yep. I got extended through this fall. And very excited to continue this work. And, and where will you go after you're done with school? Good question. I have been debating if I'd like to go into healthcare, if I'd like to stay here. Um, right now, it's a matter of where I can apply these skills. So, we'll, we'll to be determined. <laughs> I'm sure they're used everywhere. So, <laughs> congratulations, and congratulations also to Karen Ness for the the team you put together and and the coordination. We really appreciate what you you do for us and for these interns. And uh, now we turn to the general manager's report. Actually, in honor of the holiday, I don't have anything, so we're going to call the meeting <laughs> short tonight. <laughs> Finish before five. So if there is nothing else to bring before the group, we are adjourned.